Iran Long Final, Ireland's aviation podcast from Squawk 7000. Well, I'm going to cheat a little. I'm actually going to tell you about an entry that's not in the logbook because actually my very first lesson wasn't loggable. It was about noon on the 21st of September in 1986 on a damp overcast day in Carnmore Airfield in County Galway. That's David Kelly, pilot and owner of a 1941 Luscombe tail dragger aircraft. And my parents had basically coupled together the money to get me a, a try lesson to see if I was really into this flying thing or whether it was just a fad. Um, and I, it's probably nearly a more vivid memory than my first lesson. It was in a rally echo in the Bravo Mike Juliet. There was nothing happening in Galway. We flew out over Galway. It was low, relatively low cloud, I suppose, by my standards. We went out over Galway City. And I have a, I have a clear vision as a 14-year-old looking down on the River Corrib at a gang of lads or lassies from the rowing club in Galway and just seeing these little spider circles in the river as they were practicing. And it, it, it has stuck with me ever since. But the first flight was actually um, a gift voucher and it was, again, out of Galway. It was, it says here, a Cessna 152 Bravo India Bravo. And the captain was John John Mulkerns. It was only a 30-minute flight. It was a gift voucher for my aunt around the time I was in college. It was pretty much a replication. It was a much nicer day. I, I flew the landing. And in some respects, it was a little anticlimactic because I knew I wasn't going any further with it. But I had already known that I wanted to do to do this thing of flight. I, I've known it since since I was very small. Tell me about the time yeah. in between. I mean you had that you had that flight when you were fourteen and you had you had the gift voucher, but you know, what kept you going and, and where did the interest come from? Well the interest has been there pretty much actually this the story goes in my house. Uh, my late mum said that when she was pregnant with me, her craving as a, a young twenty something year old was to go flying, just to be up among the clouds. And she didn't fly. She had never flown. It's kind of, it goes back to the womb, according to everybody in my house. (laughs) I mean, the thing that kept me going was actually the Air Corps Alouettes flying overhead and landing in our local hospital. Uh, That was pretty much my fix of, of real aviation. There was very little to sustain me. I was very much in the sticks from an aviation perspective. And of course, I was obviously like everybody else making model airplanes and drawing pictures. I mean, when I was a, a youngster, there was one book in the library about aircraft and it was uh, it was Learning to Fly, I think by David Ogilvy. It was a, a very early textbook and that's all I had. So take me then to the next flight after that, that gift voucher, what happened then? I'm looking at 98. That yeah, must have been just the end of college. I had spent a, a lot of time, spending too much time out at Kuna when I was in college, mm-hmm. uh, just hanging around the airfield and picking up stuff from other pilots and just learning how to, to move airplanes and fuel airplanes. It wasn't until I got my first job and was living in Dublin that I, I started to, to dabble in getting lessons. So the next flight was in um, March of 99, again in a Cessna 150 with an A Walters. And that would have been just a, an intro flight. And it was very hit and miss then. I was working after college, didn't have an awful lot of money. There are big gaps in the training. There was maybe three flights in, nine, in, in 99 and then nothing for quite some time until I actually moved to another company who had a flying club based out of it. And that's when my training started in earnest. It was in, um, in late 1999, I started flying the TB9 from Weston. And that's really where my training started in earnest because I was flying with just two instructors and it was one airplane. And it was a little bit more regular, not as regular as it should have been. But isn't that the story for so many people? When you, when you look at the early pages of somebody's logbook, you know, on, unless they've, they've signed up for a, a full-time course, there's going to be big gaps while you're trying to get a few bob together. And that's very much the case. And when people ask me about learning to fly, it's one of those things that I tell them, you know, either, either fly yourself into debt or save the money. But <laughs> there are so many variables which will be working against you as you try and get your pilot's license. You need to eliminate gaps as much as possible. It's, it is possibly the most inefficient and expensive way to learn to fly is to do so just sporadically. Are we at first solo yet? We're not. Uh, let me see. Oh, 
yeah, we had a very mixed bag, actually. I'd, <laughs> I hadn't realized how mixed it was at the start. So I was flying the TB9 for on and off for a year, and very on and off, let me tell you. <laughs> and then I took um, a month's holidays to go over to a buddy of mine in New York, and there I stuck on about 19 hours of U.S. flying. Mm-hmm. out of Republic Airport on Long Island, just outside of New York. My grand plan had been, oh, I'm going to the US, I'll take a batch of money, I'll go over to the US, and by the time i finished in the US, I'll at least be solo and maybe a bit further on. I think in the 19 hours, I probably had six or seven instructors. Mm-hmm. So I came back, and I'm just wondering here when exactly I went solo. About July 2000, I'm looking at 2001, I'm looking at 2002, and I'm still seeing lots of PUTs and no solo time yet. Nope, more circuits in 03. Oh, wait a minute. Here we go. It wasn't until 2003, three years later, that I actually went solo. It was the 25th of June, 2003, and the captain was uh, the illustrious Paul von Langhausen, who will be known to many of your listeners. Paul took me flying. It was an interesting uh, day. It was The winds were light, but uh, variable. And the first couple of landings I did with Paul, I went, yeah, this, this isn't happening. I don't know why this isn't working. And when we landed, I realized that what had happened was the wind had been shifting because when we took off not long afterwards, they had reversed the runway direction. So I had actually been trying to land with somewhat of a tailwind component. So when I actually went flying with Paul the next time, it was rock solid, and that was to be my solo flight day. I think because it had taken me so long to do it, I had a certain self-awareness about being in the airplane in the sense of a lot of people talk about a massive leap in performance when your instructor gets out and a certain anxiety. I actually have a very distinct memory of being on late downwind. I had done my checks, I made my radio call, there was a quiet moment in the aircraft and I purposefully looked at the empty seat on the right hand side to tell myself I was doing this. It was me. I'm flying. And I think when I landed, it was a it was a mind shift for me because once I had landed, once I'd done that, you know, one circuit and landed safely, it, nobody could really take away the fact that at that point, that's when you're a pilot. You're not qualified. You can't go in and take a, a plane on, on your own legally. But the bottom line is you can start an airplane, taxi, take off, fly and land. That point is the point of where you become a pilot. Funnily enough, it, it's sort of faded a little bit in, in, in memory for me. I think for me, the first flight was nearly a bigger deal. But uh, yeah, there was much to be done thereafter. I mean, that was just the first solo. It took me considerably longer to get to uh, to get to have the full ticket. I'm sorry, I'm flicking through the page here, so this is why I'm slightly distracted. Because not long after, well, hang on, let me see. We flick down, we do some more time on the TB9. Lots of circuits in Weston, and there was a lot of sporadic flying. Yeah, there was some solo flights on my own, but I remember my wife, well, my my then girlfriend kind of said, look, you know, you're flying in a club out of work. Yes, it's uh, more cost effective. It's, you know, it's, it's cheaper to fly in the club, but the instructors were voluntary. We had one aircraft. So, you know, we, we had an awful lot of variables, you know, the aircraft had to be available and and not down for maintenance. Your instructor had to be available. You had to be available. My wife says, why don't you just go to a school? Just do it. Just throw the money at it and get it done. And that led to a another change in school. So I then moved over to a flight school in Weston where I was flying the Grab 115. And, and that's what carried me through to the flight test. But as I look back at my logbook, the vast majority of my time are on odd types for trainers. And from there, eventually, I got to the point where I was let loose on the world. <laughs> After a, a long flight test, actually a failed flight test, I am really dousing myself here in glory. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my first flight, uh, flight test, I'm not going to name the examiner, 
so as not to embarrass him or me <laughs> any more than we need to. <laughs> but I remember him saying distinctly after he had given me um, um, a failure, he said, I was absolutely certain, absolutely certain walking out of the school to the airplane that I was going to be passing you. I had I had been so well prepared. I had answered every question in the room, including stuff I really shouldn't have been able to answer mm. because I will devour airplane stuff. Yeah, I failed. <laughs> I made a complete hash job of of the nav and most especially the um, the landings. I was disgusted with them because uh, it took me probably three attempts to do the uh, the flapless landing, and I had done them the previous week. And they were a non-event. I, I just they didn't even register. It was just I'm flying an airplane. Okay, I don't have flaps. So that was several hundred euros down the tube for no good reason. I rescheduled the flight test, and not one to to shy away from from what some people would say is a challenge. I re, I redid it with the same examiner. I thought no. It was just me. It had nothing to do with the examiner. And yeah, pass with flying colours. Mm. Uh, there were no issues. I had actually, by the time I'd gotten the the flight test, I had already started the ball rolling on acquiring my first aircraft. I say oh. first aircraft, my own aircraft. <laughs> to date. That, um, now, that's a massive jump. And yet you're now saying, oh, well, no, I don't want a club aeroplane. I'd like my own one. That had always been sort of a parallel consideration. A couple of things happened at the same time. I had been aware of the area of home-built or kit-built aircraft, and I, th I think you spoke to Mark Burton in a recent episode. So I had always been aware of the concept of being a home-builder. So this was in the back of my head all of the time. I thought, Do you know what? We could build our own airplane, and I'd have my own airplane to fly. And I got a piece of advice from one inspector who said, for your first aircraft buy a share for your second aircraft, finish a project. And only then, only then consider for your third aircraft building. Because he said, you really have to ask yourself, are you a builder or are you a pilot? And I had spent quite a bit of time on the RV forums, the, the, the vans, mm. um, home built uh, scene. And I was aware that the amount of time that people spend in the workshop was really quite high. And they needed to spend a lot of time, so it was a long gestation period. And when I was, when I was being brutally honest with myself, I really wanted to build an airplane, to fly an airplane. So I then started looking at, well, can I buy a permit airplane? And that's what starts me down the route of where I am now in terms of vintage tail draggers. In 2021, my airplane will turn 80. Oh, okay. I know. I I frequently look at it and go, you know. You know, before long before I finished flying, this is going to be a 100-year-old airplane. This is actually going to be in the territory. The way I look at it, actually, is Charles Lindbergh and one of the Wright brothers was still alive to see my aircraft fly. It's a Luscombe. It's a 1941 Luscombe 8. It started life, as far as we can tell, because all of them have been modified slightly. It started life in Trenton, New Jersey as an 8D and it was then subsequently modified to be an 8E, which really just uh, gives additional space in the back, and it's, there's an engine change. So mine has a, an 0200 up front, and mine is a comparatively rare ragwing variant. They were offered from the factory both with metal wings and drag wings. It's getting properly nerdy here. Uh, and it was an option. And they're both entirely interchangeable. So if I if I really took a figuri to get rid of the rag wing, I could just take the rag wings off, acquire myself a set of metal wings and put them on. Many people have the metal wing version of the of the Luscom. I think they probably look a little better, but don't tell my airplane. They're apparently fifty pounds lighter as a fabric. And fifty pounds is a lot in a in a small two seat airplane. When I was thinking about buying an airplane, I was kind of going back through my memory bank of different airplanes I'd seen, because whatever I would buy would have to be at least interesting in in some measure. And I remember seeing an airplane in Kuna when I was a student, and it was a Luscom, and I think it was EICDZ Charlie Delta Zulu, and thinking, 
what a pretty airplane it was. The Luscombe has um, has a fairly sophisticated nose bowl. There's a lot of manufacture that goes into the cowling, and it it ends up with a kind of a smiley face to it. It actually has a little bit of a of a characterful face, which appealed to me. And the more I read about them, there was a lot of old wives' tales about them being difficult to fly and land and handle on the ground. But all told, they'd look to be just about the same as an Aronka Champ or a Piper Cub. And I thought, yeah, this might be the airplane for me. And at around this, I found one for sale in Norfolk. And I got in touch with a guy in Wales who would be an authority on the type from a technical perspective. And I said to Pete, I said, look, look, you don't know me, but there's an airplane for sale, but I've told you know a lot about them. Would you mind coming over and taking a look at this? Now, bear in mind, I'm pretty certain I didn't actually have the license at this stage. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a high level of commitment here. There's not an awful lot of talent, but there's a high level of commitment. And we hopped in a little Kia Picanto and we drove from West Wales to Norfolk. And that is about the two furthest points east to west you can get in the UK in a tiny little car. And by the time we got back to Wales after having looked at it, we kind of agreed that the airplane we looked at was was fine, but you'd put a few thousand into it and it still wouldn't be a really, really nice Luskin. And Pete was restoring one in his garage as a hobby because that's what he did. And he says, look, if you're not in a rush, right, if you want to bankroll this project, so it kind of a pay as you go when I need money to, to buy materials. If we work on that basis, you know, I'm happy to sell you the one that's in in my garage. And that's basically the start of my Luscombe story. Well, there's two nice parts to that. One was the relationship obviously built up on in the small car and the journey yeah. over. But also <laughs> you got to know the person who had their hand to the aeroplane before you did. Yeah, I had known him by reputation beforehand but yeah, I mean, it's it gives me a high degree of confidence with that airplane. I, I mean, I've seen it taken apart. I've seen its restoration. So for me, in terms of purchasing an aircraft, I've been very fortunate. It's like I knew exactly what I was getting. You know, every inch of it has gone, been gone over. And it's not only just been gone over by somebody rebuilding an airplane. By the time Pete was building mine, I think it was it was definitely rebuild number three and Luscombe number four. So by the time he was getting to my Luscombe, he knew them back. And it was, I mean, that made the whole process easier. Now, what also made the whole process easier, for those of you that are old enough to remember, is uh, Charlie McCreevy's SSIA program. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, for those of you that don't remember, uh, there was a government scheme that ran for about, I think four or five years. Mm -hmm. And basically for every uh, four euros you'd put in, the government would put in one. And I think pretty much everybody in Ireland bought into this scheme at some level or other. That basically paid for my airplane. Every time I go up to that hangar, that's the result of my my saving. And And I have to say at this point, a very, very helpful and cooperative wife because at the same time we had just bought our first house. Literally, we had bought a small little council house in Dublin that needed the work. Like the first few years were very, very hard. There's a touch of romance in in every pilot's story. And I'm curious about the first time you and your airplane were alone together. (laughs) Yeah, that's not as romantic as you might imagine. (laughs) That, in fact, actually is, yeah. The first time that uh, myself and the Luscombe had a significant amount of time together, because obviously I'd done, I had done my training and I'd done some solo flights, but I brought it back from the UK. Um, I brought it back from Oxy Airfield near Gloucestershire. And that flight was the only time I have had a weather related incident, despite my best efforts. So we we uh, we bonded. I won't say in fire, but it was uh, it was fairly it was fairly challenging. I was bringing the aircraft back from Oxy, and before we set out, I had obviously rang my CFI in Dublin to get a, a handle on what the weather was like in Dublin because I knew I was bringing it back to me. A pal of mine who owns a Luscombe is BA training captain, 
very cautious, doesn't believe in flying the Irish Sea with anything less than four engines. Mm -hmm. We went down through the weather reports. We talked to him. We thought, okay, this this looks okay. It's certainly okay to get to Wales for a refuel, and we think it's okay uh, from there on. So it landed at Wales, pretty uneventful. Fueled it up to the gunnels because I do not believe in crossing water with air in the tanks. I put on several layers of clothing. <laughs> Everything I could find. Now, granted, this was in August, but I put on every layer of clothing I had. I had a life jacket. I had all my work done. And I headed off to the Irish coast. And I got to the Irish coast. Or as I was approaching, I went, that cloud does not look right. (laughs) That cloud does not look as high as it's forecast. And by the time I got to Wexford, it was on the deck. It was about 500 feet. So I thought, okay, it has to be Waterford. There's no way I'm chancing Dublin because the chances are if this is on the coast, it's probably going to move westward. So if I try and go up the coast, I'm just going to get pushed further and further out and I won't have any plan. So I thought, you know what? I'll fly down along the coast and I'll see if I can see Waterford. I eventually got into Waterford and honest to God, I I think that is possibly the best landing I have ever ever executed (laughs) it was an absolute greaser and i went up to the guy in the tower so i went up to the tower and i said is there any chance i get a cup of tea (laughs) because i have something stronger he must have figured there was some sort of dissonance going on because he said do you mind me asking um how many how many hours do you have (laughs) i went yeah i've only got about a (laughs) hundred hours And he he looked at me and he says, I was absolutely certain when I was talking on the radio that I had some fella here who had like three or four thousand dollars under his belt. He says, I couldn't tell. Ferrying them across the Atlantic. (laughs) Yeah. And I said, well, to be honest, I I knew it wasn't exactly the most pleasant of experience. I didn't want to make you worried. (laughs) (laughs) And yeah, I've never gotten a weather call wrong again, but it was... um, I, you know, I landed, I rang my wife, and my wife had been at the airfield in Trevor, which no longer exists, mm. to pick me up. And I went, yeah, yeah, I've landed, I'm safe, it's all well. And she was kind of, well, your airplane's not here. And I went, no, no, I'm in Waterford. And I could hear it in her voice. I went, do you want me to drive down? <laughs> And I went, no, it's okay. This is on me. I'll stay over. Another test of up. love, yeah. Yeah. Oh no, I have. I have had so much support at home for this this aviation adventure. <laughs> yeah, and just for the record, that is the only time, <laughs> the only time I have ever gotten it even fractionally marginally wrong on the weather, despite my best effort. A, a superb learning curve. But David, if you've, you've shared with us there the, 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 the butt clenching flight, <laughs> for the want of a better word. The only one, yeah. What about your most favourite? The, the one that if you were to, to you know, to, to, to capture and, and play back over and over again, was, was there a, a glorious flight that you've had in your own aeroplane? If I was in a nursing home, in an armchair, and all of my memories were gradually slipping away, the memory I'd want isn't that one. It isn't the one of the first flight. It isn't the one of the first solo. It's actually my second, well, it's probably actually my third, but we'll call it my second aerobatic flight. Oh. Yeah. I got I kind of got talked into trying aerobatics by somebody who kind of understood me a bit better and realized that the way to talk aerobatics to me was not not to talk adrenaline, not to talk high G, high energy excitement, but to to, to reach me more cerebrally. And I went to I went to Cambridge to do some aerobatics and I was brought out on a demo flight in the extra 200. And it wasn't the best. There was only some small spaces to do some aerobatics. But my instructor, Anthony, just demoed a couple of maneuvers for me. And I've written about this. We went up and we found this patch of blue. And there's towering cumulus around us. It's a beautiful sunny day. These these tall, white cumulus clouds around us. And there's, there's a patch of blue, big enough to fly safely, but not enough to teach me aerobatics. And I remember Anthony rolled looped and barrel rolled the airplane it was a moment of this is what flight is about i was 
in the sky, playing among the clouds, watching the shadow and light move across the, the cockpit of the extra, watching the shapes of the clouds change and watching the blue and the landscape just interchange. And it was just one of those moments where, yeah, I knew I knew for a fact that I wanted to be able to do this. And it, it's a visual that has stuck with me since. Because when you're the passenger in the, the extra, you're sitting up the front seat and you're actually quite close to the canopy. And the wing is sort of behind you. And it's almost like just you in the air. It's easy to kind of ignore the airplane around you. So this this sensation, this, I mean, these were all very gentle aerobatics. There wasn't anything outstanding in the maneuvers, but it was just the, the romance of it, I think. And I think that's the memory for now. That's the memory I'd want to hold on to. But I had a, I had a moment around the time my mum died a few years ago. My mum passed back in about, uh, wow, 2014 now. It's gone back a while. And a, a book came into my possession by Commander Chris Hadfield. It was called An Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth. And the one of the things I took from the book was when he was so small, he decided he was going to become an astronaut. There were no Canadian astronauts. It didn't exist. It was, in fact, an impossibility. And I think the thing that struck me about that was, well, that was kind of, if I was really bluntly, brutally honest with myself, that's what flying a Spitfire would be for me. It's it's the uh, impossible, but not entirely impossible impo- dream. And so that's always sat there in the in the back of my mind as something I'd, I'd like to do. Um, and a lot of the things I do try to move me in that direction. That was the other thing that came from the book. He says, um, you know, even... Whatever it is in life, may not be flying, it, it, you know, it, it may be medical, it may be climbing a mountain, it could be something else. But he said, uh, Chris Hadfield basically said, look, whatever it is in life that you want to do, move yourself in the direction. Do the things, change the things about yourself to get you in the place, to move you towards where you want to be. And even if you never achieve the goal, wherever you end up stopping, you'll be stopping someplace you want to be. And I thought, I wish I'd known that when I was younger. And that came to me kind of just a few years ago. And I went, do you know what? Yeah. Anything I do, I'm going to make sure that it's it's moving me in a, in a path I want to do. So I've I've flown some vintage airplanes. I, I obviously own a vintage airplane. Um, even the aerobatics, there's a, in the back of my head, it's like, you know, nobody ever flies a warbird if they don't if they can't fully fly an aeroplane in in all three planes and so that's it's it's somewhat of a holy grail i think um but it's been a good motivator to i suppose to get better and i think it's something that happens to a lot of pilots it's very easy to get to a point where you stagnate and you don't you don't have an external motivator okay i have my license now what Uh, and i think the spitfire has for me, or any Warbird, if there are any P-51 owners listening, <laughs> yeah. um, any any Warbird has given me a sort of a framework around which to build my flying so that all of the things I've done, the aerobatics, the class rating instructor, the vintage airplane stuff, it's moving me forward. I may never, ever sit or solo a Warbird, but all of the things I do are things I want to do. Talk about bringing your family flying. There's a lovely story that you've written uh, online about flying with your dad, which is, I suppose, for every pilot at some stage, it might be an option or not, uh, as the case may be. I write an occasional blog. I flew with my dad one day and it took us a while to actually get together in the same spot to go flying. And I don't really want to spoil the story. (laughs) It wasn't out of any... uh, malicious intent it was just there's a pair of procrastinators and we just never got around to being in the same place as an airplane and 
he told me stuff about himself and his life that he hadn't told me before. And I've, I, I'm definitely going to write a piece about this. Airplanes are strangely confessional places mm, for people. Yes, absolutely. Um, You'll see different characteristics coming out of pilots in the air that you wouldn't see in the ground even. Oh, I mean, even for passengers. I've flown with a couple of people who have told me things in confidence that I don't think they'd have told me on the ground. But the flight with my dad, we left Galway. We flew down around the coast. We were trying to get down to where... My mum was from originally in West Clare, but weather was sort of against us. So we turned back and he pointed out a couple of the houses he had designed. Uh, he was a draftsman in his younger years. And it was a lovely experience to be able to do and to be able to share it. And it was, I don't know if I mentioned it in the piece, it was slightly bittersweet because I never actually got to take my mum flying, who, even though she wasn't very vocal about it, was probably one of my biggest supporters in terms of learning to fly. That's one of the things that flying does if you let it. It teaches you about yourself and your own, what's important to you, but also what your own drivers. It points out some of your weaknesses as well as your strengths. We consider ourselves as a tribe of aviators, but actually we're not. It's, it's the, we all fly and we have that in common, but even within that tribe, people get different things from it. So, mm. so there are in, there are pilots who are engineers. Their airplanes may not be the prettiest, but they'll be absolutely running perfectly. Touch of the, the zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. Mm. And then there'll be people like me who are probably a bit more romantically inclined than technically inclined. And I suppose it's nearly the differences that what are what make aviation such an interesting place. Yeah, I mean, it, for example, for decades, for decades, I would never have thought I was an aerobatics person. But it wasn't until the right person with the right sort of frame of mind came along and put it to me in a different way that I went, oh, maybe. So I think that the beauty of aviation is actually not that we are one tribe, that we all have the same story, but that we have one interest, but so many different stories and so many different viewpoints and approaches to that. And if if you haven't met the pilot that inspires you, it just means you haven't met this, the right pilot. <laughs> because I think all of the stories that people have have the ability to inspire somebody else to do something. David Kelly, thank you for joining us on Long Final. Thank you so much for having me, Michael. It's been an absolute pleasure. And anytime you want to talk to your friends, you know where I am. And thank you for joining us on this episode of Long Final from Squawk7000.ie. If you'd like to hear more, please subscribe and do tell your friends.